So I'll, I'll give you a sort of medium length explanation. So I'm not going to go super short, but I won't talk about it for like 17 hours, which I could also do. So uh, I will begin by describing the jhanas. Uh, so there are these eight distinct states of consciousness called the jhanas. Um, and they predate, they're a big thing in Buddhist meditation, but they predate Buddhism. And you also see some Christian mystics describing them. So the jhanas appear to be something kind of fundamental about the brain that the brain can do. Um, there's eight of them, but then there's a state that's nicknamed the ninth jhana. Uh, and this state is called Naroda Samapati. And it's a complete cessation of consciousness. Um, there are two different types of cessations. There's the Naroda type, which based on your, depending on your intention, uh, can last uh, minutes up to days. Um, I think there's, there's accounts of it lasting for weeks, but I don't think anyone alive right now can do that. I could be wrong about that. Then there's another type of cessation, which is transient. It's like uh, someone sort of chopped a couple of frames out of a movie. So you're sort of like having experience and then there's this blip where something's missing and then you're having experience again. And often the first couple of those that you have are uh, life-changing. Um, so those are the two types of cessation. And the phenomenology of it is very interesting because it's a... It's a <laughs> There's no experience. So the, the experience even, are, yeah. <laughs> is gone and the experience is gone. So you can sort of describe like what it's like to go into and what it's like to come out of. But being in a cessation is like there's sort of nothing about it because there's nothing there. Um, Yet the, the physical body is still maintaining breathing. It's still vital signs, all of that. Exactly. Yeah. And there haven't been too many like long-term uh, studies of people in Naroda for a long time, but we're hoping to change that. So with the paper we just published, we outlined basically a research program for here's how we could study this thing. And one of the reasons it hasn't been well studied is that, as you may imagine, people who can actually do this stuff are pretty rare. Uh, you really have to kind of you have to put in some serious retreat hours to be able to do this. Um, and then once you can do it, it's not like, oh, you can just do it forever. Uh, most people have to actually go back on retreat and ramp up again to be able to do it again. So, so I have some fMRI data of uh, very advanced practitioners having the more transient type of cessation in the scanner. And uh, amusingly, I was trying to study the jhanas I told these people don't have any cessations in there. And one of them had 12 uh, anyway. So I've got the data sort of by accident. Um, but the thing with fMRI is that our time resolution is long. So um, I got the time resolution as high as I could on this study, but it's still 680 milliseconds. And that's a long time in brain time, uh, whereas these transient cessations are very uh, fast. For the longer Naroda uh, stuff, so far we only have EEG data, uh, and some of that's in the paper. And we see some changes in, uh, in the alpha frequency in the brain, which is the uh, sort of alpha is an attentional signal, and it puts things together. So, so right, so this, this cup. You know someone's about to say something interesting when they pick up a cup, always. Uh, so this cup, it has a shape right? And it has color and it has this pattern on it. And these lines have a particular orientation. All of those different properties are processed in completely different places of the visual processing hierarchy. It's like, you know, this is in Kansas and this, the, the shape is in Kansas and the color is in California. And yet somehow, mm. somehow we perceive this as a holistic, as one object. And that's alpha. Alpha binds all of that together so that we can sort of like clump things together and make sense of the world. And we see in Naroda, the alpha uh, rhythm becomes much less organized. So there's a suggestion there that perception is kind of uh, de, uh, decoalescing, <laughs> decohering. So that's very interesting, but there's much more to be done in that direction. And so 
our limits are uh, the resolution of our tools, the sophistication of the questions that we can ask, um, and uh, the strength of our experimental design. And those will always kind of track with our practice, or at least speaking personally for me, I can kind of tell where my practice is by the kind of scientific questions that I'm, that I'm trying to Interesting. ask. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's like your, uh, level of sophistication and in inquiry is congruent with the depth of experience. Yeah. And you can't, you can't answer mm. a scientific question that you can't think of. <laughs> mm. So this is, this is why the scientific community is great is we're all kind of in this discussion together and we're making, uh, the, the questions that we can ask is really about the quality of the question. Um, we're all making the questions we can ask better. Thank you for checking out this clip. If you want to see the full episode, you can do so by going up here. I hope you have a wonderful day.